In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, me and my co-host Leaf Tulin, we are going to discuss Bilal Koulibaly, who is quickly rising. I have him in my, in my lottery. Some people may have him in their top 10. But if Bilal is rising, that means somebody is falling. And me and Leaf are going to discuss the potential players that could be falling with Bilal's rise. Stay tuned. Shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And my co host for today is Leaf. To lean, Leaf has you. You've been pretty busy lately. What's 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 new in your world? Uh, I've been been traveling all over the place. Just got back from my cousin's wedding and drove back into town, working the the usual day jobs and hoping to get a little basketball and tennis in there. So uh, in the last last couple of days, I've been all over the place. And are you still doing like the locked on or jazz? Are you, are you still hosting that? Uh, David's back for locked on jazz up until, uh, a week, like about uh, 10 days from now. And then I'm back for three weeks, then he's back and then I'm back for another two. So uh, on and off right now, I've, I've got a little less podcasting work, a little more other, other jobs work and trying to keep myself active in the meantime. Yeah. I wish I had time to hoop. I haven't played since we left. Chicago and I keep saying I need to go do it but I just it's got too much too much work to do but anyway let's talk about Bilal Koulibaly so I did a a newsletter that dropped on Monday and I briefly talked about it on the podcast but I've heard multiple people um and one of the one of the guys that that mentioned this to me someone that that you know you're pretty close with and he mentioned that there is an opportunity that the Jazz may be interested in Bilal Koulibaly, which means they could take him at nine, which means they may feel like one of the point guards that is potential, one of the point guards that a lot of people think that they're targeting in with, with their first pick could be also be available at 16. So first of all, what are your thoughts on Bilal's rise? Has he Has he reached lottery status to you yet? Uh, I need to watch his latest couple games. I'm a bit behind on on his most recent film, and i I have this theory that recency is really propelling him. Which, in fairness to him, he's doing what he needs to do to take uh, take over. Like he he needs to flash. And while all eyes are on Wembenyama, they're seeing the supplementary player in Bilal Koulibaly do a lot of things that are desirable at the NBA level in a slowed down environment like when Benyama goes to America and plays in the G League and the speed of the game and he scores 37. Um that that's a that's something that you can factor in. So him scoring you know pedestrian 11 points a game is more impressive pre- impressive than a college player scoring 11 a game. Uh that said I have him 18 right now and I think he'll likely rise the more I watch. I've been hesitant to watch much film recently because I think I'll I'll have recency. Like I'll look at the positives because I like to, at the end, see what the player can do. And I wonder if that'll, if I do that too much at the end, if I'll start moving players up that I had a, had a reason for having lower. Um, So he's one of those guys. I think I need to watch more recently just because he's got more on tape as opposed to the college players. I watched so much of like throughout the year, I had a steady dose at the beginning, steady dose, the middle steady dose at the end. Um, he's one that I think I'll, I'll likely move up the board more, but it, it, it's just, I've got this hesitation to watch extra film and really judge it because I don't want to make overcorrections. Well, I think with him, I think it's a necessity because he wasn't playing a lot at the beginning of the year. And if, if it was not for multiple injuries, he may have not been in the rotation, but as you see throughout the season he he gains 
more and more confidence in himself, but also the coaching staff has more confidence. And we're talking about right now, the Metropolitans 92 are in the French Pro A finals. So yesterday's game was a, a game clinching victory over Asheville, which is the, I mean, I guess it's like the Lakers or the Celtics of French basketball. It's the defending champions, Tony Parker's team. Now they were missing Nande DiColo, who's like, I think he's like the all time leading scorer in EuroLeague. Bondo can play. That, that guy is he good. Def- he can definitely play. And I've had a chance to watch him when he was in Europe. But you don't see 18 year olds get that type of freedom in, in Europe. France is one of the more respected leagues. And not only has has the coach trusted him just to, to play big minutes, but he's trusting him to make decisions with the ball. I mean, there's times where he's playing as a playmaker, but I'm just more impressed with the way he moves, like his fluidity and how effortlessly he glides across the floor. To me, that's that's special. He's knocking down shots, not a high volume of attempts. And I think the last time I looked, he was shooting in the high 30s from three. The free throw percentage makes you wonder if the, the three-point percentage is a little inflated. But it's it's the passing, the athleticism, the defense, and his ability to just score without dominating the ball, whether it's cutting, whether it's running in transition. And again, this, this team is going to the French Pro A finals. And you can say two of their top five rotation players are teenagers, so 18 and 19 year old. And that just does not happen. So said so all that to say this. I think with the recency bias, I think in his case, it is legit because you're watching him perform in pressured environments in in like games that they must win and they're going to the finals. So I I think it's definitely worth your time. Now now yeah. where did you have him and you may may not remember this, but where did you have him like two months ago? I think I had him out like 27. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I tend to be a skeptic in the in the, in the players that show flashes late and are showing less production in leagues that are less. I guess the way I'll put it is if you're going to be from a league that is not as commonly viewed and I don't know as much about, you're going to have to really dominate the league to get on my radar to the point where I can say, well, I buy that flash so much that I'm going to put you in the lottery. And I know there were some people that were on on him a long time ago. And props to you guys. It looks like he's likely going to go in the lottery. Uh, for me, I thought a lot of those flashes were were reaching in terms of what you're seeing because the amount he was doing it was so little that you wondered, okay, if, if he were to do this more often, would he still have similar efficiency? And that's the same with a lot of players in college basketball. And they come back for a year and they're the feature guy and their efficiency drops, but their game improves. Um, and that's kind of what I anticipated, but for him to be scoring the way he was, and that was lesser than what his, his totals are right now, it made me a little concerned to have all these slashes, but you see an athlete of that caliber. So I always had a first round grade, but I will admit I was a bit slower to come around and I still think I am. And, and I'm going to do a pretty deep dive this week as I have a little more time and try to see if I sort out for myself where I have him and try to like block out the outside noise. I think that's something that at times I become interested in, I see so much of it. I'm like, oh, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't trust my eyes. But in this case, I just haven't watched enough to formulate a fully consolidated opinion. Yeah, and that's definitely fair and definitely valid. It's just his trajectory over the last 18 months has been incredible. Like, like I said in a previous podcast, unless you really were, were paying attention, you probably don't remember him playing at all in the the showcase game against Ignite. I do remember the first game he got some minutes and he looked lost. And at the time I was just thought, yeah, you know, this is a guy that we're paying attention to in 2024 draft and some injuries opened the door and he's just got better and better and better. And during the playoffs, he's playing his best basketball during the playoffs, which think about like in the NCAA tournament, how many guys were we high on all year and they did not have strong NCAA tournament games. And Bilal is playing his best basketball at the right time, and he's still only 18 years old. Again, that's something that you just don't see in, in Europe. But Europe is hard to evaluate and scout anyway. 
I think I probably have a little bit better handle on it just because I've, I've lived over there and I understand how difficult it is. But anytime you're scouting a European prospect, unless it's like a generational guy like Wimbayama, you only have the small, small sample sizes. And the better they are, and if they're playing on a, a better team, then they're not playing much at all. I'm like Tristan uh, Vucevic. He's a guy that I tried to watch last year. And the best way for me to evaluate him in person last year was get to the game an hour early, watch him warm up to see his shooting stroke, see like, you know, how he moves in warm ups. And then like the spot minutes he would get with like two minutes left in the, the, the second quarter or if, you know, one of their, their, their veterans was in foul trouble. And even now, I think like it was hard to really evaluate him this season until he came over to the combine and showed and showed some flashes. All right, when we return, if Bilal is moving up, which it looks like he is, then somebody's falling backwards. So we'll find out. I'll ask Leaf, what players does he think could be victims of Bilal's rise in the draft? But before that, I want to talk to you about Game Time. Now, if you're not familiar with Game Time, it is an app where you can get tickets to your favorite events and you can get them without having to be stressed out over finding them because Game Time is the fast and the easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They have killer deals on last minute tickets and they have a best price guarantee so you can stop stressing over the tickets and get hyped for the fun that you'll have. Now, I think I'm going to wait until the last minute and see if I can get some Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence tickets on game time. I mean, the tickets are going crazy. They started off at like 200. Last I checked, they're like 500 or so. Game time. I'm, I'm trying to get my tickets through you. But if you are looking for events and you're looking to plan in advance, you don't have to do that because game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. They have flash deals on football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. They have a game time guarantee, which means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. You get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. So download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On NBA, and you get twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day, and in tomorrow's show. It'll be either Leaf Tulane or Richard Stamen. I mean, those are my go-to guys. So either one of those guys will be on tomorrow's show. All right, let's talk about who could possibly fall out of the lottery if Bilal Koulibaly jumps into the lottery, which I fully expect. Who is your first candidate to fall out the lottery? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. There are guys that are a bit, you know, some people love them, some people don't like them, and there's a chance that they fall if a guy like Bilal leapfrogs them, a guy like Nick Smith. Some people have very high, some like myself are a bit lower. Uh, there's Keontae George. So I think some players like that. Um, I, I would even say if Bilal, let's say you mentioned like Utah is a team of three picks, and if it, let's say he's going to go in the top 10, there's a few candidates that I think could slip a little bit outside the top 10 that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I think one of Anthony Black or Case and Wallace would fall at that point because if you look at team necessities, a lot of the teams that are picking um, in the five through seven range are, are, lo are looking wing. And then you look at the guys seven through nine, and I, it looks like you're probably not going to have Hendricks or Walker fall. And so one of Osar Thompson... Case and Wallace and Anthony Black makes sense in those two spots, but I, I think I think one of those type of players. I'm not necessarily going to pick who because I just don't know who's infatuated with whom. But mm -hmm. should Bilal Koulibaly go top ten, I'd, I'd expect one of those guards that's touted as a good defender 
and a quality athlete with some offensive limitations in the case of Anthony Black or Osar Thompson, and then Casey Wallace, just a bit smaller than the other two, would fall outside the top 10, which they've largely been projected for the entire year. All right, you're the GM of the Jazz. At nine, are you going point guard, or do you feel like you can get a point guard at 16? I personally am a best player available type of guy, and so I would take a wing, and then I think the treasure trove of guards is is strongest at 16. Now, if you if you really believe that Anthony Black or Casey Wallace is the best player, then go ahead and take him. Um, but but should a guy like Jarris Walker somehow slip to you, or Bilal Koulibaly, should the Jazz really be infatuated in, with him, which I don't know. As a Jazz fan, I really wish I knew, but I, I just don't know what they're going to do, and it drives me nuts. Um, I would... I would say that 16 is stronger at guards than there are at, are at wings or bigs. So I would rather take a wing if you ask me. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the Jazz mostly need a point guard, so maybe go get the best point guard. But I, I, I'd i prefer take a wing and then get a guard at 16 because I really buy the depth at 16. I like Jalen hood an awful lot at 16. I think a lot of people really like Bufkin. I could talk myself into him. I think Nick Smith or Keontae George, there's a chance one of them is there. And then there's other players that that if you know none of those guys are there, you you can still get a productive player. So I'd go best player available. And if you made me pick wing or guard, I'd probably lean wing. I had a long discussion earlier today, and I didn't I didn't see it, um, but someone had mentioned that Casey Wallace fell outside of the lottery on ESPN's last mock. I think they had him going to Atlanta, and then just a few hours ago, I saw that he canceled his workout. With with Atlanta, do you think Casey could be the guy that falls out the lottery? I, I interpreted that more as he's going to stay within the top ten, and he doesn't feel like he needs to uh, do the interview elsewhere. Um, I, I don't know. I think he's got a game that people project for because he scores more easily than Anthony Black. If you made me pick and and choose which guy falls outside the top ten that's been a top ten all year, I think it's Anthony Black. But I, I don't. I wouldn't put any money on that. I've got no level of confidence. But I just think Osar Thompson is unlikely to fall uh, to that level. I think Casey Wallace is more easily projectable than is uh, Anthony Black, at least in the immediate short return. So I would, I would say he's the guy that falls outside the top ten. Uh, if Hendricks and Koulibaly kind of leapfrog he, he Wallace and and Osar Thompson, it should that or or a couple of those players should that happen. I want to ask you about another guy that is, is rising, and I talked about him in a newsletter and in the podcast from yesterday, Bobby Clinton. What's your thoughts on, on Clinton? I'm a fan. I've, I've had him first round for a, a while, actually. I I don't know how long everyone else has had him more on their radar, but I, you just don't see too many players at his age, his size, uh, with that shooting ability and the dexterity and athleticism that he possesses. Has he put it all together yet? No. But you watch him play, and you say, wow, like I bet you that guy's probably 6'7", uh, if, if you were to say like the way he shoots. Now, if you watched him and you saw his height, you'd be like, oh, because of the way he's so skilled, you're probably guessing he's 21. But he's 18, turning 19. And he he really understands the game, shoots the ball well. He's twenty. Turned twenty. I yeah. thought he just turned nineteen. So maybe I, I March. guess maybe there is more maturation than I realized. Yeah. Well, that's part but, of the reason I was asking because I think there is this um, misconception that he's eighteen years old, but he's he's twenty. He was a twenty year old freshman. He turned twenty in March, March six, two thousand three. So does that change anything for you? Not really. I've never been an age person to begin with. I would just say that my interpretation, the way I viewed him as seeing a freshman, and it did help that I thought he was 18 turning 19. Um, the way I interpreted what he did, I thought he was advanced for his age, and I still think he is. I think he's advanced for the role that he played as well. Uh, he was able to seemingly like play a stretch four as a freshman, and then that's what he's going to do at the NBA level. And I think his agility is solid. I think he'll only get stronger and you, you can't teach touch at that size and co or coordination of fluidity. So I think he's someone that likely goes in the first round that wasn't talked about much up until about a month ago. 
And that's why I think it's so interesting. Like, how often do we talk about a guy that's 20? And and I understand that 20 is not old, but sometimes in the basketball world, they may think if you're 20, it's not necessarily old, but it's not necessarily like an 18-year-old. But how often have we seen a guy that was 20 years old? I guess he was 19 through like 90% of the season. Only average like five points per game, but then gets a first round grade or gets a promise for a team that part is is hard for me to wrap my 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 head around or my mind around or whatever when we return i'll talk a little bit about we'll go a little bit more depth about bobby clintman but i want to talk to you about prize picks because you only have a little bit of time left before prize picks one million dollar promotion is over well i shouldn't say it is a promotion but i mean you have to do some work to get the million dollars but every day of the NBA Finals, one prize fix user will win a chance to become a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern will be randomly selected each day, and whoever placed that entry will be given a six-pick flex with the following payouts. If you get all six picks correct, you will get $1 million. If you get five correct, $80,000. Four correct, $16,000. And the full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million, but you must opt in to be eligible for the million dollar entry. Once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal and you could be the lucky winner. And the game is just pick two to six players and you decide if they'll score more or less than their prize picks projection. And you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. You're not competing against your friends or just random people. It is just you versus the projections available and Prize Picks offers projections on any sport, NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, PGA, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer. They even have esports. And the entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. They have safe and fast withdrawals. And it is currently operational in 30 states and Canada. So all you have to do is just download the Prize Picks app, go to prizepicks.com, and sign up and play daily fantasy sports. If you are a first time user, you get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, price picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, price picks will give you $50. So do not forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. All right, we left off talking about Bobby Clintman, and I don't have him as a first rounder. And, you know, we're getting closer to the draft. I definitely get the intrigue. I mean, the size, the shooting, the passing. I know he averaged like five assists in, um, at the U18s. But I will say it was like Division B in, in the, the FIBA U18s. I get the intrigue. I, I totally get it. But would you have taken Bobby Clintman or Baba Miller? You have to choose between the two prior to the season i mean like right well i guess prior to the season and right now because i wonder if baba miller opted to to enter the draft i think he would look good in workouts and i think people would talk about him climbing up draft boards too well i i had baba like top 15 entering the year i I thought he was going to be exceptional i think it really hurt him that he wasn't able to play those first what was it 11 games uh, due to some silly rules from the NCAA, uh, yeah. but uh, I I get that point. I think Baba Miller is the more talented player. If you ask me, like the top level traits that each possess, I'd probably lean Baba Miller. But what I saw in college favored Bobby Clintman. I think I think that's fair to say. Um, he's someone that uh, I'd be willing to like. There's a couple players towards the end of my big board um, that I have in the first round as first round grades. It's him. It's Kobe Brown for a different reason. He's older, but he shoots and he fits his fits the billings of what what I think a modern late round pick should do. It's Chris Murray for that same logic. Uh, there's there's Julian Phillips. Um, there's Max Olivier Maxon's Prosper guys that I think have NBA traits that can make a difference um, in a second unit and eventually play their way forward. And a lot of these th- players you could poke holes in. But at 20 to through 30, the success rate's pretty slim. So to be picked here in a good draft, to me, means that they have the ability 
to be contributors uh, early and often in their careers, which some drafts, you just don't get that at this point. And these guys, I, I all could make a, for all of them, I could make a very real argument that I could see them being successful in the NBA due to specific strengths that are strong enough to be first round caliber grades for me. I, if you had to guess which team, and I've been asking people this all weekend, and because someone brought it to me, um, if you had to guess which team gave him the guarantee, who would you guess? Ooh, uh, let me look at my uh, the who's picking where. Uh, all right, here's me being smart but not necessarily honest. Uh, I'm gonna go with the Pacers because they have the most picks in that range. Is it, that's that's one of the names of the teams that came up because the Pacers has four picks in the top 32, three in the, in the first round, and their early second round pick is at 32. I've heard that the Thunder, just because he fits the, the, the type of player that they look for, and then some are saying maybe the Jazz because the Jazz has, has multiple picks. Um, and then I, someone even mentioned Memphis as, as a team that they think could could be – the, the team that has given him a guarantee. So my next question for you is, do you think his guarantee is in the first round? I'd imagine so, or else why would, why would he avoid drills or things that could help his help his stock? I feel like that would be strange to hide if you were given a guarantee of like the top pick of the second round, even I feel like you, you well, it happened last people... year, Caleb Houston. Uh, I think in in this case, Caleb Houston uh, had a less athletic frame. And so to have that guarantee was pretty strange to go number 32, if I remember correctly. So he might as well have been like, well, you know what? That's better than where I'm going to be. So I can take it. So, I mean, I suppose that's that's fair. I just think that's more irregular than betting on yourself and, and would be unless you're giving a guarantee in the top 25. Yeah, it is weird to me because, I mean, Houston was more product- productive as a 19-year-old freshman than Clintman. And he, if I'm not mistaken, he even shot a higher percentage from three. If not, it was very close, very similar. But yeah, he was viewed as a better shooter coming in as well, too. He was just very streaky. Yeah, he shot 30, 35% from, from three at Michigan. But I want to say, like, at one point in the season, it was low. Then it got to, like the high thirties and then it went back down to about 35, but yeah, Caleb Houston, which still makes no sense to me, got a guarantee and shut everything down. I was actually in Vegas and I talked to him and I was going to like interview him and do like a little feature. And then the next day they were like, Oh, he's, he's leaving Vegas. And then like later on that day, that's when I saw that he opted not to go to the combine and then he kind of shut it down. And then Orlando Orlando drafted him uh, at 32. So I'm thinking with Clintman, I, I would say I think his floor is 37 at OKC. But I wonder, like, all right, what number could make you shut down? All right, let's say, let's just, you know, just hypothetically, let's say it's the Jazz last pick. I mean, I think that if he went through the whole pre-draft process, he could end up going higher than that. And this was a conversation I had with an agent. He just thought that unless it's like somewhere higher than we think that he's making a mistake because he feels like he could definitely be a big riser in the process. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I wouldn't, like I said, I mean, the difference between 32 and 28 is a bit of money, but it wouldn't be more than what he probably could make himself by coming back and making himself like a fringe lottery pick. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to look at the who's picking where and trying to see if there's a team I think stylistically could use a player like him. It, one that comes to my mind a little bit, and I, I don't know why, is Brooklyn. I think Brooklyn likes some rangy wings. They've got plenty of them. They're 21, and that's a range where I feel like that's high enough. You think, you know what, that's something. And Portland crossed my mind as well at 23, but the difference between 23 and 28, it might be enough to me to to make that like leap of faith. Be like, well, if they promised me, you know what, I'll take it. Um, but I wouldn't do it at 28. I, I think there's too much to gain by tr- betting on yourself, uh, especially when you have the fallback of even if you don't play well, you're not necessarily 
like lured into the NBA draft night. You can return to school. And so I think he must have something higher than we anticipate because I, right. I think the same way as you do. So let's say if it is like 23, that puts him in Leonard Miller range. I think Leonard Miller's going in the in the teens, but I think but well, I, I, I get your point. Yeah, I've talked to someone that that is pretty close to the situation. They feel like his floor is around twenty three, maybe twenty six at the absolute bottom. But they they feel like you know he he's going to go in the teens, but just you know being absolutely safe, they say that he'll go in the twenties. But I think that. Leonard Miller, one, he's younger. I think he he's not the shooter, but I still believe in Leonard Miller as a shooter because he shot like 79% from the foul line. But to me, that would be absolutely crazy if Leonard Miller averages what he averaged, like 17 and 10. 17 and 10, yeah. And he gets drafted in the same range as a guy that I, that's older Average five points per game in college, while Leonard did it in the G League. To me, that would that would that would lead to a great podcast discussion. All right, let let's talk about who do you think could possibly fall out. Since I mean, you already had Clinton in your first round. Who are some of the players that could possibly fall out, or or that are in that draft range that could end up going being selected behind him? Oh man, this is going to be interesting. Um... I'm trying to think because guys with a lot of potential have some swings to them. So like a guy like city Sissoko is someone I at one point had near my lottery. I didn't love what I saw at the combine. I don't think he falls out of the first round, but I think he could fall into that similar range. I would say uh, jet Howard is someone I could see falling due to physical reasons, not due to skill set. I think people would fall are going to become enamored by a skill set. Uh, because, you know, you can't teach height and shooting, even though he was bad defensively and rebounding. But should his ankle re- testing uh, hinder his progress? And, and I'm, I don't know anything specific, but, but if, you're, if you're getting legitimate smoke about having a re- reconfigured ankle, uh, that may drop you. So that's one. Uh, I would say those are the two that come to my mind. I wouldn't be surprised if a guy like Jalen Wilson, maybe a Jordan Walsh, you have like fringe fringe first round appeal uh, aren't first round picks. Personally, I don't have either of them in my first round, but uh, I don't know if Clintman's really the one that's going to shake things up. I think a guy like Jordan, uh, Julian Phillips, excuse me, or, uh, or Rayon Rupair might fall down because he, you, you just haven't seen anything special, or he's a guy that a team could be, fall in love with and say, you know, we can teach him how to shoot and he's got a seven, three wingspan and defend. So I think there's a lot of, little minor moves that'll cause a, fl- a flood of moves for teams to see players fall. Yeah. I think repair is going to surprise teams with his shooting. And I'm saying this just from watching him shoot during the, uh, the pre-draft or before he started doing the workouts when he's here in Dallas, I think he will surprise some teams with his shooting there. And I mean, it's, it's easy to forget that the guy missed like two months of the season with a broken hand or wrist. And that will impact your shooting. Well, that wraps up this episode. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. It's always great talking to my guy, Leaf. Leaf is one of the best in the business. I tell you, you guys got to listen to Leaf now because in a few years, you're going to be like, man, I see this guy on TV. He's a big star. You got to listen to Leaf right now so you can say that you were on him early because he's taken off i mean you, you you're doing locked on jazz multiple weeks in a very big year like this is not you know a, a year where the jazz don't have any draft picks this is like a huge year for the jazz fans and covering the draft so you're getting all this great exposure david lock you know the, the the big dog at the Locked On Network handpick you and trust you. So you definitely got, got big things coming your way. But anyway, thank you, Lee, for coming on. Thank you, the listener, for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day and a success. And we are out. Out.